Due north of San Francisco is a 1.7 mile long bridge with towers nearly 750 feet tall. It is one of the West Coast's signature monuments with an iconic color and scenic view. Despite its popularity, or perhaps a part of it, was its complicated construction that some deemed to be outright impossible. Today, we discover the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm your host, Ryan Sokesh, and you're watching It's History. Before talking about the Golden Gate Bridge, we need to talk about the city it calls home, San Francisco. It wasn't always a part of the United States, that should probably go without saying. However, the local history goes back much further than most would initially think. San Francisco, or perhaps the land that San Francisco would eventually take up, was first inhabited in 3000 BCE. For reference, at that time, Egypt first domesticated the camel, and the first rocks that make up Stonehenge were laid. The Native Americans inhabiting this region lived in relative peace for thousands of years, moving in and out of the Bay Area as needed. Fast forward a few thousand years to the 1500s and Europeans began to sail along the west coast. However, they always missed the San Francisco Bay due to heavy fog. Francis Drake landed at Point Reyes, only about 35 miles away from the strait, but the fog was so thick that he didn't notice it. It wasn't until the 1769 Portola expedition led by a man named Gaspar de Portola that Westerners first laid eyes upon the bay. A Spanish settlement party led by Juan Dianza came north from San Diego to build Fort Presidio in 1776. Eventually, it would come to host over 1,000 native converts in the mission established in 1797 and provide material support for everyone in the area. But the development didn't stop there. At the turn of the century, many whaling ships and traders made nearby Yerba Buena a regular stop on their travels. The settlement would see a change in hands in 1821, where Mexico won its independence from the dwindling Spanish Empire, becoming its own republic. The mission began to fall off as Spanish control was changed out for the new establishment. Then in 1828, Jedediah Smith, a transcontinental pioneer, came to the San Francisco Bay through the Sierra Madre Mountains followed by an Englishman named William Richardson who founded a settlement in the Bay Area in 1835. As you can see, many Americans began migrating to this site, but another significant change was coming. As James K. Polk won the office of the President of the United States in 1844, Polk was one of the biggest supporters of Manifest Destiny, the ideology that the United States and its citizens are morally superior, and that their duty was to spread their way of life to everyone else, if even by force. Polk had his eyes on much of Mexico's land, particularly the recently independent Republic of Texas, which had asked to enter the Union a few years before. The United States initially declined due to the Northern Senators not wanting to add another slave state to preserve the congressional balance. Polk quickly moved to annex Texas, as he had no such scruples, but Mexico declined his offer to purchase the territory. And not being one to give up without trying some underhanded tactics, Polk's troops caught caused a provocation in the Mexican state of Coahuila, which both nations had previously recognized as belonging to Mexico. What he hoped for was a fight, but instead, he started a war. The Mexican-American War became the United States' first significant armed conflict on primarily foreign soil. As part of the resistance, around 12 American settlers seized a herd of 12 horses from the Mexican authorities of Sacramento Valley in early June. As a result, when another group of Americans captured Sonoma, the local capital, the authorities couldn't formulate a response. So under the leadership of one William B. Ide, the occupying Americans issued a declaration of independence and hoisted a new flag over the town, beginning the California Republic. The flag had been designed a few years before the revolt and was flown about, but it wasn't official until the insurgents raised it over Sonoma. It was white with a red stripe on the bottom, decorated with a California grizzly bear and a red star with the name California Republic in the center. Funny enough, the red star was added partially due to Texas, as they had declared independence from Mexico earlier in the century. Some in the California area felt the Republic of Texas held many kindred spirits that desired freedom, just as they did. 
But clearly, many Californians did not preserve this sentiment upon their entry into the United States. Speaking of the United States, not long after the revolt, Captain John Charles Fremont arrived and declared his support for the revolt. The Californians liked him so much that he was elected the first head of the republic. Though it was not to last, as the USS Portsmouth under the command of Commander John D. Slowed landed in the area. In an impromptu naval invasion, its sailors and marines disembarked and occupied San Francisco and Sonoma on July the 9th. He claimed the whole of the Republic as the territory of the United States knocking down the bear flag and replacing it with the stars and stripes. Thus, with only 25 days of independence, the California Republic came to an end. Not terribly long after, another event leading to the population growth requiring our famous Golden Gate Bridge occurred, when a carpenter named James W. Marshall was in a stream bed of the American River and noticed something abnormal, sparkles in the water. What he had found was California gold. Marshall entered an agreement with John Sutter, the owner of the soon-to-be mill, to keep the find a secret. Unfortunately, the news of this gold spread like wildfire, and Sutter found himself inundated with thousands of people looking to get rich, panning for gold on the west coast. Rather than enjoying the gold rush, Sutter was robbed by the countless unwanted guests on his land. They stole his livestock and many of his other possessions. Ironically, he was bankrupt, not even five years after the discovery. The California gold rush was up and running, and prospectors came every way they could. The easiest path for many was to sail around South America. Others sailed down to the Gulf of Mexico, hiked across, and then sailed the rest of the way. But it's worth noting that both options were extremely deadly. And this is where the saying, I hope it pans out for you, originates. By August of 1848, there were around 4,000 prospectors in the area searching for the promised and ever so rare metal. Only one year later, the so-called 49ers jumped the number up to 80,000. Come 1853, and the population peaked at 250,000 prospectors, all rushing into California for gold. These new residents extracted an estimated $2 billion of gold through the gold rush, but very few individuals walked out of the endeavor wealthier than they entered it. It was simply not worth it for many, as the living conditions were less than ideal, well, to put it nicely. Over time, the deposits ran dry, machinery replaced much of the manual labor, and the once uncivilized or outright violent mining camps calmed down enough to be considered settlements. This was also partly due to new law enforcement. After 1852, the gold rush slowed more and more until the end of the decade when the last veins were depleted, drawing prospectors elsewhere. However, going all the way back home after all these years of searching for gold was not always the most popular idea. And as a result, many of these miners became permanent residents in the area. Before the gold rush, California had a population of around 160,000, most of which were Native Americans. By the middle of the 1850s, 300,000 people decided to call the state home. Settlers came in from Europe, South America, and as far away as China, with many ending up in San Francisco. And as the gold rush was over, the next big thing was the silver rush. However, it wasn't much of a rush, as silver takes much more effort and is quite expensive to extract. So-called silver barons had a monopoly over the precious metals. Some of these businessmen desired a transcontinental railway to make the connection easier, and proposed that territories gained in the Mexican secession would legalize slavery to make construction less expensive, which was quite controversial, as the issue of slavery was tearing the nation apart. California had seen many Northerners enter the territory to get their hands dirty looking for gold, and just as many Southerners who brought slaves with them to do the work. So during the Civil War, San Francisco was heavily armored by the U.S. government, particularly at Lime Point and Fort Point, the narrowest strait at the entrance of the San Francisco Harbor. It had become such a vulnerable point of the West Coast that the government was genuinely concerned the British would attempt to annex it during the chaos of the Civil War. Towards the end of the Civil War, the Union drastically scaled up the defense of San Francisco and all of California to prevent a raid in the dwindling days of the Confederacy. And this period saw a lot of changes to communication, information that once reached California in 12 days via the Pony Express, now arrived in a moment 
by telegraph. And such was the case with the Appomattox Courthouse Treaty. San Francisco exploded in celebration upon hearing the news, but within a week, this celebration took a horrible turn, as the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln reduced the city to complete and utter chaos. A newspaper office with pro-Confederate sympathies found itself ransacked by a loyalist mob. These same groups attacked citizens in the street at even a hint of Confederate allegiances. In the end, the military stationed in Fort Alcatraz marched into San Francisco to restore order, breaking up riots and punishing anyone who dared to celebrate the president's death. That same fort would fire half-hourly cannon shots in mourning of the late Lincoln. Despite the Civil War, the Transcontinental Railroad would be completed in 1869, finally linking California with the rest of the country. By then, the mouth of the San Francisco Bay had taken on a new name, reflecting the endless wealth that poured out of the lucrative trade point and the rush that made the area what it was. The strait between Lime Point and Fort Point became known by a now iconic name, the Golden Gate. For years, many living in the area proposed a bridge across the Golden Gate, but at the time, it was simply impossible. This hypothetical bridge was brought up so often that it became known as the bridge that couldn't be built. As a 1.7 mile long bridge over turbulent water would be a monumental task, even in the safest areas. One could describe the Golden Gate Strait with many words, but safe was not among them. Strong tides, wind, and blinding fog all posed serious dangers. Not to mention the San Andres Fault just seven miles offshore. The Golden Gate was quite literally one of the worst conditions a bridge could find a home. Until the turn of the 20th century, the bridge that couldn't be built remained only a concept. As an estimation, pricing it at $100 million continued to put it out of the reach of a war-torn United States. That was until an engineer named Joseph Behrman Strauss came forward with a plan to build budgeted just between $25 and $30 million. Strauss was a native Ohioan and graduate of the University of Cincinnati. He was fascinated with bridges, even proposing a bridge across the Bering Strait to link Alaska with Russia as his senior thesis. And when he heard of an undoable bridge across the Golden Gate, he immediately got to work. His final design was a suspension bridge that the city decided would become a reality in January of 1933. As part of the Golden Gate Bridge construction, the military decommissioned Fort Point Light in September of 1934, as it was directly beneath the bridge. However, the Lime Point Light on the north side of the bridge remained strategically valuable. Starting as a fog bell signal station in the Civil War, it gained a lighthouse at the turn of the 20th century, remaining active even after the bridge's completion, as the structure did not compromise its location. By 1961, the Coast Guard automated the system and tore down the remaining buildings. One of the biggest challenges of the construction was the work taking place underwater, as the bridge's south tower was over 1,100 feet from the shore and had to have a harbor constructed at its base before the team could even think about getting anything done. Starting construction of the south tower was precarious, as divers had to dive 110 feet into the Golden Gate Strait, placing dynamic charges to clear the way to the bedrock, and later guide the forms and funnels that would place the fender. The Strait's merciless, dark and murky water in an ice-cold abyss of angry current and tides provided diving to be one of the most dangerous parts of the project, and on top of it all, portable air tanks were still a thing of the future. Air was supplied through a hose from the surface to the diver's helmet. If that little hose snapped or the air pump stopped, the diver's life would be lost. By the time the foundation was completed, the harbor was no longer sufficient. So workers constructed a roadway on a wooden trestle to the shore to allow construction equipment to cross the water. However, it was too exposed to the ocean and didn't have any signal equipment. So 1933 saw both a freighter collide with the road and a storm tearing down repair efforts within two months of one another. The workers continued regardless, rolling with the punches and reconstructing the trestle as needed. However, the South Tower wouldn't need to survive any collisions. To protect it, the workers built a massive concrete barrier around the base. Any ships would just collide with the fender, leaving the tower unscathed. The fender was made beneath the water level by routing concrete tubes to a wooden form, allowing it to set. 
Upon its completion, workers affectionately called it a giant bathtub, since it was still filled with water. After emptying this so-called 9.4 million gallon bathtub, workers reinforced it with steel and even more concrete. With the fender in place and the concrete work done, the team completed the steel part of the tower in six months. A suspension bridge of this size was simply unheard of before. At the time of its construction, the two towers, each 746 feet tall, were the tallest bridge towers in the world. They were so massive that they required cranes placed on platforms along two legs. The 44,000 tons of steel were shipped from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania through the newly opened Panama Canal and went up these platforms to find their place in the structure taller than a 60-story building. With both towers now completed, the main cables went up next. At three feet in diameter, these cables turned out to be 12,000 tons each. For a little context, if they were placed on a simple barge, that barge would sink in an instant. The construction team decided to use a process called cable spinning to build them. They strung up a pencil thick wire to the towers, then did the same thing in the opposite direction. They repeated this until all of the 27,572 wires were in place, at which point they pressed the strands into a single much thicker wire. The process took six months total, which set a new world record for speed and efficiency. With the suspension set, it was now time to hang the roadway. The triangular trusses kept the deck steady against the wind, with vertical suspenders holding it in place. The construction team built the roads from the towers until meeting in the middle. The final roadway deck was placed on April the 19th, 1937, marking the end of construction. At the time, safety wasn't exactly a concern of construction teams. The public usually assumed that a worker would die for every million dollars spent, but this assumption didn't sit well with Strauss, who wasn't keen on taking at least 30 men's lives. Hence, he was one of the first to provide hard hats as a part of the workplace uniform. These hard hats were adapted from a design for miners by the E.D. Bullard Company. They would alleviate part of the risk posed by falling debris, he also issued glare-free goggles, face and hand cream to combat windburn, and even advised diets that would prevent dizziness. But the safety measures didn't stop there. The designer commissioned a safety net beneath the bridge as it was under construction. While it did cost an additional $130,000, it saved the lives of 19 of the workers. These men would come to be known as the Halfway to Hell Club due to their little brush up with the Reaper. Unfortunately, even with safety measures in place, tragedy would occur. On October the 21st, 1936, the construction saw Kermit Moore as its first fatality. Less than four months later, on the 17th of February, 1937, 10 more men met their demise when a part of the scaffolding broke, plunging into the safety net, pulling both it and the workers into the abyss of the Golden Gate. On May the 27th, 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge opened at 6 a.m. to a crowd of around 18,000. On opening day, 15,000 people an hour were permitted to cross the bridge at only 25 cents a pop. Simply walking across the Golden Gate Bridge on its own opening day was an honor, but not enough for some. Carmen and Minnie Perez took things to the next level as the first to cross the bridge on roller skates. Later that same day, the bridge was also crossed on stilts. After the inauguration, access for automobiles was open. Finally, after decades of writing it off, the unbuildable bridge was complete. Struss had written a poem for the opening day called The Mighty Task is Done, which opened with this stanza. At last, the mighty task is done, resplendent in the western sun. The bridge looms mountain high, its titan piers grip the ocean floor. Its great steel arms link shore with shore, its towers pierce the sky. The Golden Gate Bridge is among the world's most recognizable landmarks and one of America's crowning jewels. Many assume that it has its name due to its golden orange color, but interestingly, that's not the case. During construction, all of its steel had a coat of weather-resistant orange primer intended to be painted over with another color once construction was completed. Irving Morrow, a project architect, felt that the orange color worked perfectly fine, suiting the location. After all, why should the Golden Gate Bridge be colored with anything other than a warm color? Thus, the color known as International Orange lived up to its name, as the Golden Gate Bridge became famous far and wide. 
And as universal as the bridge has become, there is also a mysterious shipwreck beneath it that most people don't even know about. Before the construction of the bridge, there was a disaster at the Golden Gate Strait. On August the 22nd, 1888, at 10 a.m., a steamboat known as the City Chester was exiting the San Francisco Bay. At the same time, the steamship Oceanic was arriving from Hong Kong. The ships acknowledged one another and attempted to navigate away from one another, but fate had a different idea. A tidal current caught the smaller vessel, drawing it directly into the Oceanic. The Oceanic nearly ripped the City Chester in half upon collision, and the ship sank just six minutes later, taking with it 16 passengers, two of which were children, and three crew members also died in the wreck. The US Coast Guard dragged wires through the water to find wreckage, but to no avail. It remained lost, and even became forgotten as the Golden Gate Bridge went up above it. For 120 years, it would lie there, silent, until May 2013, when a Coast Survey response team came upon the wreckage using sonar, just 400 feet from where they estimated it might be. It still lies there today, mostly intact and keeping much of its form from when it once sailed the waters. The San Francisco Bay has a long and complex history leading up to the Golden Gate Bridge. And although Ansel Adams worried that its existence would destroy local beauty, even he ultimately changed his mind. This bridge weighs nearly a million tons and uses 80,000 miles of wire, which is enough to circle planet Earth three times. Until 1964, it was the longest bridge in the world, and by 2015, over 2 billion vehicles have crossed it. And with that in mind, perhaps it's safe to say that the Golden Gate Bridge is an absolute monument to American ingenuity. I'm considering doing a follow-up video about what's inside the Golden Gate Bridge's towers. Let me know if you think that's a good idea by subscribing or leaving a comment. This is Ryan Sokash, signing off.